Good morning, Florissant Valley. Good morning. Welcome to the 44th David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture. As a part of the Underwood tradition, being the recipient three years ago, I am here to give the welcome and the formal introduction of this year's recipient, our friend and colleague, Steve Allen. Steve serves the campus as the Engineering Technology Center Supervisor and has taught as an adjunct faculty member for many years. He has been a full-time professional employee at Florissant Valley for 41 years and has taught for 39 of those years. I will provide fun facts, tidbits, accomplishments, and some of the many firsts about Steve later. Before we move forward with today's event, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our campus lost this July, Myron Marty, the 1976 David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture Award recipient. He was the first to receive this award and served Florissant Valley as a professor of history. We send condolences to his family and friends for their loss. Now, on to the welcomes. At this time, I would like to ask Steve's lovely wife, Lisa, to stand and be acknowledged. It is wonderful she is here to enjoy and be a part of the special day for their family. I also believe their two dogs, Sheba and Scarlett, are home giving high five paws to each other to celebrate as well. I would like to welcome the following people in attendance today. With great gratitude and honor, it is my pleasure to welcome Mrs. Annabelle Underwood and her daughter Kathy Herman. Please stand. They have supported our campus community throughout the years and helped to keep David's legacy alive. They have attended the announcement event in the spring of each year at the David L. Underwood Library and have attended 42 of the 44 Underwood lectures in the fall. Amazing. Thank you for your continued support. Next, I would like to welcome our campus administration, Elizabeth, Jan, Steve, and Deborah our Florissant Valley campus faculty and staff, as well as district administration, other campus faculty and staff, and board of trustee members and attendants. A special shout out and welcome goes to the previous Underwood recipients in the audience. Please stand to be acknowledged. I would also like to thank the following people for a recent project which required the gathering of history and archive material related to David Underwood so that it could be stored on a site and so that a personal interview could take place with Mrs. Underwood and Kathy. Mary Lukey conducted the interview. Sharon Fox and Kathy Riley researched and prepared the materials to be used for the interview and to be loaded on the Underwood site. Mia Hampton for allowing the amazing Aaron Linderer to utilize a portion of his work time to record and edit not only the interview for the archives, but for editing and organizing the last four Underwood lectures so they may be available on the site as well. Bravo to all, let's give them a hand. Now, about the award in David. David L. Underwood joined the Florissant Valley faculty in 1963. He served as the chair of the Humanities Communications Division then later served as Associate Dean of Instruction. He served as the Dean until his untimely death in 1975. The background of the award. David L. Underwood was known for his love of education. He was deeply concerned with the welfare of students and staff alike. His dedication went beyond office hours and he tirelessly gave of his time and talents to further the educational mission at Florissant Valley. Recipients of the Underwood Memorial Lecture Award demonstrate that same dedication and commitment. Chosen by a committee of peers, recipients exhibit excellence in instruction and a genuine humanistic concern for students, faculty, staff, and all in education. The criteria for the award. The award recipient must be currently employed at Florissant Valley. The award recipient must have a strong record of achievement of excellence in instruction or instructional related activities. The award recipient 
must have a record of evidence that shows a genuine contribution to the field of education and a human, humanistic concern for faculty, students, and all persons in education. The award recipient must have contributions clearly beyond what would normally be expected, and these contributions must be demonstrated over an extended period of time. The award recipient must have satisfied these criteria during his or her tenure at Florissant Valley, and the recipient is selected on the basis of a consensus of the committee members. A new addition, which has become part of a tradition since the amazing Dr. Paul Higdon became a part of our family, is that he selects prepares and performs un uh, music unique to the recipient each year. This year's selections are three of the dances from 12 Spanish dances by Enrique Granados. Please welcome Paul to the stage.
Let's give Paul another round of applause for his excellence in performance and moving music selection. I am so pleased to introduce this year's recipient, Steve Allen. As I mentioned before, he has worked full-time for our campus for the last 41 years and has taught 39 of those. He must have started when he was five years old. His formal education includes a BS degree in industrial technology from SEMO, an AASCT degree in electronics engineering technology, as well as an AABA degree in business administration from STLCC at Florissan Valley. Steve truly knows and has lived the community college mission. <coughs> Excuse me. He started as a student, became a part-time employee, and continued as a full-time employee, and he hasn't left us yet. A few fun facts about Steve. He is one of three siblings. He won a spelling bee in the fourth grade. He played ice hockey as a goalie on frozen lakes and ponds in North County as a kid. His local softball team won three championships. He loves dogs. This is how he and I connected when I came to Florissant Valley. He referred me to his local vet in Florissant, which I still use today. He saw the moon landing on TV. He started his first business at age 13. He named it SE Services. That was very professional, Steve. It was a lawn mowing business. He remodeled a four room shack in Old Town Florissant and at 17 then moved in as a renter while starting at Florissant Valley in 1978. He is an avid off-road motorcycle, Jeep, and ATV rider, and he has ridden over 2,000 miles in Colorado. His favorite robot was the robot on Lost in Space. I think this explains a lot. <laughs> His love of technology and robotics is still a big part of who he is today. <laughs> Steve noted, that his best memories at St. Louis Community College at Florissant Valley is seeing the proverbial light bulb in students go off in his class. He loved developing and motivating students to challenge themselves. And the first building of the Hammer, or my first housing building with the child care department, which was an opening week activity. Lastly, but most importantly, Steve started dating his wife in 1977, and they've been together ever since. Next. I would like to list a few professional accomplishments and firsts about Steve. There's a long list. He has served as a past president of Tau Alpha Pi Engineering Technology Honor Society and has been a longtime member. He was inducted into the Phi Theta Kappa National Honor Society in 1980. He has received the NISOD Teaching Excellence Award. He has received the John and Suzanne Roosh Excellence Award. He was named as the campus adjunct faculty member of the year in 1997, which was the first year it was offered. He has received the St. Louis Community College Florissant Valley Professional Employee of the Year. He helped to install the first wired computer network at Flow Valley with the Data Processing Center. He managed the first online computer system with McDonnell Douglas using a phone line, a teletype unit, and a tape machine. He was on a team that built the first mini computer at Flow Valley for the college to use. He was on a team that built the first microcomputer lab at Flow Valley. He built furniture for the first CAD lab computer workstations. He modified 24 drafting tables at his home workshop for the college to utilize for its classes. He worked on a team at Flow Valley to run the first fiber optic network for each building. He built the first robotic arm with microprocessor control. He built the first robot unit for the department and he programmed it to greet his mom and to sing happy birthday. He managed the team that deployed the first department webpage for STLCC for the engineering and technology department. He managed the team of faculty and students to build the first 3D printer in the department. He designed and taught the electronic project design and fabrication course. He is the only continuous instructor for 40 years. He served as a campus team member overseeing and organizing components needed to run the first robotics Lego competitions at our campus. These competitions have brought thousands of students and family members to Florissant Valley through the years. Our campus has received high praise for the quality of our events and how well they are run and organized. Steve has been an integral part of its success. I could go on and on with multiple examples of firsts. Steve has initiated, managed, or taken part 
of at Florissant Valley, but he will have many other th wonderful things to say during his lecture. Steve has given tirelessly of himself to our campus for over 40 years and continues to bring passion to his work to serve our campus and our community on a daily basis. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the nice guys. Welcome, please welcome Steve Aylin, our 44th David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture recipient to the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Cindy, that was quite an exciting stroll down memory lane. Thank you also taking, for taking time out of your busy retirement schedule to come back to honor the tradition of the Underwood presentation. As you've indicated, I've been involved in a wide variety of roles here, and I've been happy to wear many different hats. When I was asked to provide an overview of my time here at the college so far, I, it brought back a lot of great memories especially of all the great people I've gotten to work with. Paul, I would also like to thank you for the musical introduction. Your key spoke volumes about me I never realized. The way you become one with the notes on the page and the piano is truly wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You might be asking yourself, why am I not at the podium? Why am I not physically present here with you? Where am I? No. I'm not still on vacation up in the mountains, nor am I physically unable to be there, or is it my stage fright from keeping me there? Actually, I'm doing an experiment for Stan Carey to see how you would react if in your next class you had a student attending as a telepresence bot. Believe it or not, this is actually starting to happen in schools across the globe. That was one of my ideas for a complete discussion. We'll talk about that change of plans later. Truthfully, I'm trying to make a point, but we'll have to get to that later as I really can't see making you sit through an entire discussion watching me on an iPad. Give me a minute, I wanna do this in person. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, let's try this again. I'll get back to my intro later. Again, good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. I know that we all have busy schedules this time of year, which can make it difficult to get away, so I truly appreciate you being here today. I myself have always enjoyed the Underwood presentations over the 40 years I've been working at this great institution. I've been in attendance in all but a couple during the early years. But I never thought for a moment that it might be me up here at any point in my career at Florissant Valley. Again, I thank you, Cindy, for that wonderful introduction. I'm really gonna miss your presence on college, your presence on campus, and your contributions to the college. Paul, thank you for our comforting musical introduction. I enjoyed the selections and opportunity to try to relax before having to try and attempt my telepresence debut. Next, I would like to thank the search committee and all the others involved in making the decision to place such an honor on me. It's very rewarding to find out you've been nominated by your peers in recognition of your work, especially your teamwork. I would also like to thank Mrs. Underwood and her daughter, Kathy, for being here today. I wish I could say I've been here long enough to have known David personally, but after attending nearly 40 of the opening ceremonies and watching the presentations in his honor, I do feel I understand the passion and love he had for his work on this campus. Your presence here has become so much a part of the tradition here. The time the three of us have gotten to spend chatting at the various Underwood activities has been very uplifting. To see your pride in David's contributions to the college, your pride in the honor, your pride in the award in his honor, and the excitement you show meeting the recipients is a special reward in itself. You have some great memories of the previous recipients' discussions. It's so wonderful that you sat down with Mary Lupke to record your thoughts on his legacy, the award, and the recipients. I know I'm gonna watch that video with much pride and be a part of that team. I would also like to thank those in the leadership team and any individuals from our other campuses and past Underwood awardees that are here today. 
Your attendance adds so much to the great community spirit we have at the college. Finally, as we all know, working multiple jobs requiring 10 to 12 hour days and many weekends really takes a lot of support on the home front. Thanks to my wife's understanding and support for my love of this job, I've been able to spend years working long hours doing a job I truly enjoy. Thank you very much, Lisa, for all you do. Finally, I couldn't be doing this, I guess a second finally, sorry about that, uh, this right now without all the help and support from the behind the scenes Underwood team. Marie, T, Aaron, and Paul from the radio station, Cindy, Shatana, and a shout out also goes to Kathy and Sharon and Jennifer and Karen. I also want to thank our newest ETC member, Ryan Fisher, who is actually the guy driving the Telebot since it's impossible to see the controls with the camera up against your face. The theater wanted my whole face on there and you can't see anything. Ryan's also the individual that laser engraved and installed the ID tags on the Memento you will receive at the end of my talk. Again, on the subject of teams, which you may have figured out by now will be part of my presentation. In many ways, I feel this recognition should be shared with all of the individuals on the teams I've worked with over the years. Without the support of other individuals on this campus, we all know I would never be able to support the college and the students at the level I have been by myself. Thank you all for letting me join your team. One of the traditions of the Underwood Lecture that I've always enjoyed is hearing the stories about the fears that go into the recipients once they realize that part of the honor of the recognition, and I do mean honor, is you get to prepare the Underwood presentation to start off the semester in the fall. The stories about stressed summer vacations over what to talk about and then all the preparation work that ate up all your summer free time were almost always a part of the morning discussion that everyone enjoyed. It seemed to bond everybody together right away, which is always a great way to start off the semester. I hope you too get some enjoyment out of my pain. <laughs> I hope I'll get a laugh myself after I watch this later, as right now, I'm not yet into the, this is fun feeling I typically get when I'm in the audience. Once I found out I was the 44th recipient of this prestigious award, I admit I was really concerned with the fact that I had to prepare a presentation that I would have to give to all my colleagues. I immediately started asking those I could, remember you have to keep it a secret, only five or six people on the planet know at this point, what are the guidelines of the memorial lecture? I was told not to worry. There aren't any. Those of you know me know my mind went into overdrive and mega list mode. I immediately started listing tasks on my 3x5 cards that I always carry and recording notes on my phone. I developed a mind map to keep track of all the thoughts that quickly got out of hand. <laughs> that night I only shared the news with my wife as Cindy was adamant that no one else find out before the reveal ceremony. Having just lost my dad the year before, I'll admit I was somewhat bummed out that I could not share it with him as I know he would have been proud. For the next couple weeks before the reveal, from time to time I would stop by Cindy's office and talk about the Underwood. I figured this was safe because we'd, I often stopped by to see Cindy about different projects we were working on. Over the years we've worked on numerous projects together such as United Way, the Wellness Committee, the Walking Challenge, She's helped with the first robotics, the fitness center, and oh yeah, we also exchange a lot of dog stories as we both truly enjoy our pet companions. Just last Christmas, Sheba, our rescued Siberian Husky, got a sister named Scarlett, who loves to bring you more than one toy. <laughs> On my first visit, I asked what other obligations I would have fulfilling the recognition in addition to the memorial lecture in the fall. Cindy explained I would be meeting with the three past recipients before the reveal in the library, and that's when I could find out some more answers. Turns out Cindy, Jan, and Carol took me to lunch at the Ferguson Brewery, which is my old buddy Joe Lanero's place. He's done a lot for Ferguson. At lunch, I found out some of the obligations such as keeping it a secret, keeping it a secret, keeping it a secret, <laughs> and that I should plan on giving a few notes of acceptance at the reveal. I was also told I would be attending a get-together with past Underwood recipients on campus in May, which thank you all for coming, 
possibly marching at graduation and meeting with the governor for another award at MCCA next year. When I asked about the guidelines for the talk in the fall, I was again told it could be about anything I wanted. But I probably should avoid politics. Each time I stopped by, I had more questions that Cindy would happily answer to the best of her ability. On one visit, Cindy asked, are you still planning on going on vacation in the mountains? And I said, yes, we've had the trip planned since last year. We go every year. She asked if I thought I would get anything done while I was gone. I told her you never know, but internally I knew it would all be about off-roading in the mountains. She then said, be careful and don't crash. It's important. <laughs> it's important that you show up for the presentation. I told her I would be careful as I'd hate not to be able there to be there because I died on the trails. I mean, you hear those stories, but. And she said so matter-of-factly, that would be okay. They'd understand if that's why you didn't show up. <laughs> After the reveal in the library, I started asking previous Underwood recipients what they thought the guidelines were. And again, I was told it can be about anything by everyone I spoke to. And they all repeated, don't worry, I know you'll figure out something. Several used almost the exact same words. It's your chance to let people get to know you, to learn what drives you. What else do you like to do besides your work here at the college? Several others said it's your chance to teach the audience about your favorite hobby or any topic you want. More than one person said it could be about your family, how you met your wife, or your summer vacation. So that's when I decided to go ahead with our planned trip to the mountains this summer and not cancel it. It was my very first thoughts. We had already made reservations on New Year's Eve last year, and no, we weren't drinking. It was just, it was just on my to be completed by the end of the year list that I'd been carrying around, you know, my purple three by five card. <laughs> At that point, I figured if I could not come up with a good topic, I could just do a presentation on my summer vacation and not have to stress out all summer wondering what to talk about. Let me tell you, I still stressed about it on a daily basis. Cindy promises me it'll go away right after I finish this presentation. <laughs> I know my title is Student Support, The Spirit Within, and yes, we'll talk about that also. But the more I stressed over finding a topic, the more I thought about it. The vacation option sounded good. So let's get back to some of our memories of the trip this summer. As you can see this year, there was a lot of snow still up in the mountains when we arrived. Probably the most snow we've seen in 30 years. Typically, it's fun to see the snow in the summer, but this year's winter was very destructive to areas with record numbers of avalanches and slides. I usually make it up to 14,000 feet and above several times in each area. But this year, almost all the passes and peaks above 13,000 feet were snowed in or had impassable access due to avalanche debris covering the trails. Before I show you some more of the memories from the trip, I want to honor another tradition of the Underwood presentation. For those of you who don't know it, it has been a tradition to include the story about the reveal in order to honor all the hard work and creativity that the previous recipient goes through to surprise the next recipient. It can truly be a challenge, as those in the know of the traditions in the valley know if the previous year's Underwood recipient shows up in your office right before spring break, Something might be up. Or maybe they just need some help. I assume what happens with the Underwood tribe stays with the Underwood tribe, but I've been told Car by Carol I can tell most of the story. I was sitting at my desk eating lunch, working on an email to a company interested in promoting St. Louis Community College on their website for our use of actual stereo equipment, not just trainers in all of our electronic courses. The goal is to help improve understanding of both the electrical and electronic concepts. We have found that this improves the retention of both the concept and the actual students in the program. They actually get to build a stereo from a kit of parts we give them. And I think they want to make sure they get it finished and they come back every time. This is a great project I could spend way too long talking about, so let me get back to how Carol surprised me. Just as I was about to hit send on my email, I hear a knock at my door from someone wanting to know if it's okay to come in. Turned out to be Carol Hake with one of our students, student workers on our engineering technology center team, Andrew McKinney. Carol then began to talk about how Andrew was such a great student in her class 
and she did not know he also worked for the department until just today. She then asked what I was working on, and I said I was working on that email I just told you about, and getting ready to run a part on the 3D printer. She then indicated she'd like to learn more about 3D printing. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, hey, maybe she wants us to print a prop for the play Andrew was talking about reading in her class. We're always trying to reach out with what we can do with the 3D printer. So I responded with, well, do you have a couple minutes? I can show you how they work. Well, those of you who know me sometimes get that same fear they used to get when they heard Dr. Freeman say that same phrase. <laughs> Do you have a minute? Sorry, Terry. I know you and I have both talked about how passionate we can be about our jobs. Well, Carol said yes, she had a minute, and off we went to the lab, where I went through my quick spiel on how 3D printers work, what types we have in the department, both purchased and team built, See again, those of you who know me know I really enjoy talking about and showing off what great technology we have here on campus. I then told her I could show her how to design a part we could print for her in about 20 minutes. Figure two hours, right? But she then said someday she'd like to learn how to design and print a part of her own. I then got what I thought was a great idea, and I asked her what she thought about me having Andrew, her student, give her, his instructor, a training session on designing one of our Hot Wheels scale model trucks. I told her I'd been grooming him to teach a module we designed years ago for the Mobile Technology Center outreach event. She thought that was a great idea and said, let's go see when Andrew can set up a time. Well, then we went back to my office and we set up a time with Andrew to design her first part. Then as we were walking out of the Engineering Technology Center in the hallway, she says, oh, by the way, you're the next Underwood recipient. I, um, well, to say the least, I was shocked, as this is an honor I thought I would never be considered for. She may call my reaction something a little stronger, but again, what happens with the Underwood tribe stays with the Underwood tribe is what I hope happens. <laughs> I've seen a lot of changes over the years in administrations, students, faculty, staff, teaching pedagogies, program offerings, classroom technology, and my favorite, the toys I get to play with in engineering. I'm excited to see where we can all take this college to the next level. To let you know a little bit more about how I got here, let me explain what happened in the last year of high school. At the beginning of the 12th grade, I had an opportunity to take a teacher education class. Upon completion of that class, I'd be given the opportunity to be a teaching assistant in industrial arts class. I had already completed every one of the shop classes my high school offered back then. At the time, our school had industrial arts classes in woodworking, metalworking, small engines, hydraulics, pneumatics, electronics, and drafting. Besides getting to work with all the neat machines, I really enjoyed showing others in the class how to use the equipment, which I often did. I think that's why Mr. Wallace allowed me to sign up for the course. There was something inside me, even back then, that created a great joy whenever I could show someone how to do something and they understood. You could always tell when someone appreciated learning a new machine or a procedure, especially if it was something they were finding difficult to understand. I was already showing my friends how to solder wires as many of us were souping up our car stereos with those new coaxial and triaxial speakers. And the last thing you wanted was for a speaker to quit playing while you were out on a date because you duct taped or liquid nailed your wires together instead of soldering. And believe me, a lot of guys were trying to do that. So it seemed natural to take the teacher education course so I could get a grade showing my fellow classmates how to use the saws, lathes, and sanders in the wood shop. After that experience, I began to wonder if I wanted to work in education, which was a change from my earlier thoughts of working in remodeling. For the last two years of high school, I was working summers and part-time after school for a friend's dad's kitchen remodeling company and a van customizing company called the Van Attic. Luckily, my older friend had a license and a car so I could ride to work with him. I thought it was so cool to get paid to go into somebody's house and tear out and essentially destroy their kitchen on Monday. And by Friday, they had the kitchen of their dreams. Same with the van shop. We'd take a stock van from the dealer, sand the paint dull, put a mural on it, and turn it into a 70s pad on wheels with inside, on the inside with a bed, bar, lots of lights, and switches, knobs, and dials, and a custom stereo in about a week. So the owner could take it to a show on the weekend and win a prize, which they often did. 
When it came time at home to talk about going to college, I can remember telling my dad how much I enjoyed the kitchen remodeling and van remodeling work and thought that one of those jobs might be a future career. These were both careers in which you could work as a team and where you could teach each other new skills without actual being an actual teacher, and you didn't really have to go to college. He reminded me at how backbreaking the remodeling work was and how difficult it was dealing with angry customers with problems outside of your control, such as their appliances didn't arrive on time. He also reminded me that the previous summer by 9 a.m., I'd often smashed my thumber with a hammer while trying to drive in a nail and still had to work till six or seven that night with a sore bloody thumb. Back then we didn't have cordless drills or cordless hammers as we do now, everything was done by hand. He told me I needed to factor in what any line of work does to one's body. He pointed out how beat up the guys were that I was working with in their 40s, no matter how skilled they were. He also thought that van remodeling would go out of popularity, that it was just a fad, even though at the time custom vans were the major rage. The minivan and SUV had not even gone into production yet. Does anybody remember Bellman vans? Well, as usual, Dad had a better vision than I did. I don't know if anybody's still remodeling vans anymore, although I've done a lot of kitchens on the side. Anyway, Dad also knew of my curiosity with stereos and hot rodding them, as he used to call it, and thought I should think about going to college to study electronics. At the time, I had a Sansui quadraphonic stereo unit that I'd already modified so that it could play through six speakers instead of four. While also attending Parks College in the early 70s, my dad had taken classes in the Army barracks that the college had started with, and he really liked the place. He suggested I go up to Florissant Valley to check things out. That's when I met Mr. Tom Bingham in the Engineering Technology Department. After a tour of the electronics lab, the radio station, and the machine shop, I thought, hey, this place is pretty cool. I think I'll sign up for classes. I figured I could learn more about electronics and apply it to stereo modifications. Remember, this was before the PC or the interweb was in existence. So if you wanted to learn more things, it was either on-the-job training, if you could find it, books, or go to school. So I thought I might even find a job that would fill that passion for sharing what I know with others. And besides, jobs in this career weren't typically known as backbreaking. So that's what brought me here to Florissant Valley in 1977, and I've been here ever since. I can still remember waiting in line three hours to register on Friday before the classes started. At that time, it was done with computer punch cards. During my first semester, I immediately began teaming up with other students in the lab as we had to work in groups, partly because we did not have enough equipment for every student to have his or her own station, and partly to teach us to work in teams. For some reason, I found using the test equipment easy to understand, and I began staying after lab to show my fellow students how to operate the meters that were very confusing to some. Remember, these were analog meters, Lots of dials, ranges, and knobs, and functions. I was already networking with fellow students because I had just spent, I think it was like $55.27 for a Texas Instrument SR51-2 calculator. It had 96 functions. That was more money than my first mowing machine and my first bicycle that I actually bought myself. I could only figure out about 10 of the functions at this point. I knew the usual, you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally stuff. Um, but the trig and other stuff was way over my head. So I was hoping to find a classmate who knew how to work my calculator. Actually, thanks to John Matasic and Bob Lindbergh, both math teachers, I was able to figure it out. Funny how knowing how the math works makes it easy to figure out the calculator magic. <laughs> After helping out in the lab as a volunteer for about two months, the senior technician, Andy Edmondson, offered me a job as a student worker. My starting salary was $1.75 an hour. And my duties were set out to set out and pick up all the lab test equipment and all the parts and pieces. The very next summer, my boss finally got his long-awaited call that he was accepted to work at the post office. This was what he thought was going to be his dream job. For the next six months, I was the only student worker in the lab. Tom Bingham and Paul Wilson, both founding members of the Engineering Technology Department's electrical area, and I filled in for the missing engineering technician, keeping the lab set up and the equipment in good repair. In the fall of that same year, I was selected as a successful candidate for the engineering tech position. After interviewing with at least a dozen individuals on one of those on-campus interviews, you remember those types of interviews in a long room, sitting at the end of a long table, 
with a large group of people from all different aspects of the campus. Very different from my interviews at McDonnell Douglas or Western Electric, both where there was groups of two or three individuals, both jobs I later received offers from, but I decided to stay with the college. I actually got hired before I completed my degree, although I did have to agree to complete and pay for the rest of my classes. Tuition reimbursement for employees was not yet one of our benefits. Since then, I've been able to help a variety of teams achieve a multitude of accomplishments here at Florissen Valley. I really feel blessed that I've had the opportunity to work with so many great team members on this campus in my 40 plus years and experience so many firsts in the Valley. As Cindy noted, there are several firsts I'm proud of and I'd like to share. As I just mentioned, I was offered my first full-time job at the college as an engineering technician by Dr. Bill Schallert, Vince Cavanaugh, and Ken Smith in 1978. Then in 1980, I was offered my first teaching position for the engineering department by Tom Bingham. In 1982, I was offered my first teaching job for continuing education by Don Tanner. In the mid-80s, I was on the team to build our first CAD lab, and soon after, I was hired as the CAD system manager by Ben Hall. Shortly after that, the department established the Technology Learning Center that consisted of an eight-station CAD lab, a 10-station TRS-80 lab, and a 10-station Apple II lab. Can't find any old pictures of it. I was then hired to be supervisor of the Technology Learning Center. My motto was to give tender loving care for the TLC to those who feared computers back then. And believe me, most of our students and many of our staff truly did. Later, the name was changed to the Engineering Technology Center because the new Teaching and Learning Center wanted the acronym. That was over my head. And I'm proud that we have the Engineering Technology Center still today. Sometime in the early 2000s, I was offered to teach the first basic electronics course to a seed class consisting of all deaf students who did not yet speak English. That was truly a, an experience for all of us. It was the first time we had an all that situation. As Cindy also mentioned, I was on the team to build the college's first microcomputer lab, which were TRS Radio Shack TRS 80s. And I helped install our first wired computer classroom with Jim Cooper from Data Processing, who's still here today downtown. I also built our first online programming lab with Tom Bingham that used a teletype and a Southwest Technical Products 6800 mini computer connected to a phone line that then connected to a mainframe at McDonnell Douglas so that our students could write and compile basic programs. Every morning it took about two hours for the teletype to read the paper tape that had all the code needed into the mini computer to make everything work. On a side note, students used to like to unplug the processor so they could get an extra two hours work to turn in their homework. <laughs> so I got together with Gary Huffstetter on the building maintenance team, and we bolted up an armored cable to the wall and the computer, <laughs> which put a stop to that. Among the other first, I was on the team to put together our first 3D printing lab. I even ran and terminated some of the fiber optic cables run through the tunnels to connect our offices and labs to the internet that we're still using today although I hear we're going to be getting an upgrade. I also built and programmed our first robotic microprocessor trainers, our first robotic arm, followed by our first rolling speaking robot, a hero unit from Heathkit. I still remember having it sing happy birthday to my mom. She was very impressed since she knew I had to enter every character of the words and every note for the music into the robot in an ASCII code on a little telephone style keypad. And in the last few years with Dave Kobe, Bill Hoffman, Kevin Porter and our student worker team, we've been working on our, to build our first audio technology lab that is now showing evidence that is helping recruiting and retention in our electronics program. Someday I may be helping someone on campus working with our first walking talking robotic instructor or robotic police officer or maybe even a robotic student of some form. Finally, I've been able to work with some great outreach activities since their start, such as Project Chart, Discover Manufacturing, St. Louis Public Schools Career Days, the If I Had a Hammer program, the CAS and Seed programs, the Mobile Technology Center, Teams, WISE, FIRST, and Project Lead the Way, many of which are still going on today. 
Another of the traditions of the Underwood presentation is for the presenter to discuss how they came up with their topic. Well, students support the spirit within is my official title. And a trip to the mountains every year is how I rejuvenate and refresh that spirit. So it's been tradition for nearly 30 years, my wife and I took a trip to the mountains as we enjoy going to the mountains and off-roading as often as possible. We've been able to cover over 2,000 miles of off-roading in four-wheel drive vehicles, either Jeeps, ATVs, or even those new UTV side-by-sides in Colorado and Utah. This year, we went to some of our favorite towns, Ure, Silverton, Telluride, Buena Vista, and Salida, and we stayed in three of them. We missed going to Leadville this year. We drove a total of 2,500 miles in the truck with the dogs in the back. They actually have their own beds and a built-in ramp in the back since I removed the seats the very first day I got the truck. <laughs> it's been a tradition for the last three trucks. Typically, my wife and I have an agreement on these mountain trips that I get to ride off-road every other day, and the other day is focused on doing what Lisa wants to do. This year's trip, you probably know I like numbers, this year's trip was 17 days, five of which were road trip days, leaving us 12, trips in, 12 days in the mountains. That means I'd normally get to ride about six or seven days. Well, this year I got to ride on nine of the days, and the other three were spent jeeping. So I was in the mountains off-roading in some way every day of the trip. Thank you, Lisa, for making that a possibility. On our days together, Lisa and I jeeped about 300 miles, both on-road and off-road, to trips in other towns. And I also got to ride my ATV 200 miles over passes up to 12,800 feet through snowpacks up to 15 feet tall. And on the last day, I got to top of one of my favorite passes on top of Engineers Mountain. It was, I had to wait till the last day. There was just too much snow. There was, you couldn't get there. That set my second highest record of 45 miles for a single ride. 72 miles is my current record, and there's an 80-mile ride with over four passes I hope to make someday. Matter of fact, the club just invited me this weekend. Oh yeah, and we also went to a parade. I actually rode in the parade for the second year with the High Rocky Riders Off-Road Club. It's a club I joined about five years ago, and at 55, I was their youngest member. Also, we went to an art fair, we went hiking and shopping and more shopping, and we got to eat out at several nice eateries. Wait, I, I can't really make you sit through an hour of vacation, so let me get back to how I came up with my topic. Since I'm not well versed in speaking to a large theater of my peers, nor have much experience putting together a theatrical production, I thought I could put on a demo or create a lecture on some aspect of robotics or 3D printing. As I noted before, I enjoy showing people how things work and talking about procedures. I feel I'm fairly well skilled in creating lectures for the classroom, but creating a memorial lecture for my peers is some, was something completely different in my mind. I first wanted to focus on robots in society, specifically in the domestic market, not about manufacturing. We're on the verge of a new wave of technology in which we'll soon have all sorts of roboticized assistance devices all over our living quarters, just like they did in Lost in Space. Does anybody have a Roomba? The cat actually turns it on. Move! Get out the way! Move! I also had dreams of getting a couple of life-size robots on campus, but that was a failed plan. Honda's got a quarter of a million dollar unit that's very realistic, very, very capable. And when I called, they thought it was a great idea for the talk, but they weren't going to loan me their toy. <laughs> then I thought, no, I should focus on robots in college, or in education, specifically in community colleges. After quite a bit of research, I found the topic limited and not really what I dreamed of. I found lots of plans about using telepresence robots in classrooms, and in some cases, colleges are actually using them. I do think we'll see them on our campus in the very new future. If you Google telepresence robots, there's 30 of them on the market now. People are using them for all kinds of things. I also found out several colleges use, were using robotic transports to deliver food to nor, dorms and other areas. That's becoming very popular. And more outside the US, there are robots used for police duties. What I didn't find were any robots acting as teachers in college-level classrooms yet. 
They're working on it, but we humans should be safe for a little while longer. I don't know if you heard the chancellor, there's a website you can go at, will my job be replaced by a robot.com? And we're looking pretty good still. There's lots of little humanoid style robots acting as teaching assistants for motivating and teaching younger kids one-on-one. -on -one. There's a fantastic market of those. But the, the kids wake up, they can't wait to get with their robot and play and, and, and learn more all day long. It's just fantastic. But it's not really a topic that moved me, especially what was going on in the back of my mind every time I was trying to come up with a topic. At the same time, I was always thinking about the topic of teams and teamwork. It seemed no matter how hard I tried to come up with a robotics topic, the thoughts of teamwork, team spirit, and teams kept coming to mind. I learned early on when I was working for the van remodeling shop and the kitchen remodeling company that teamwork and team spirit was so inspirational for myself. To see how much more you could get done with a team of individuals with varying talents and skills was so energizing. If you need electrical work, you've got the electrical. You need the I mean, you just had a team of people. Being able to work with such great teams of individuals to support our students is why I enjoy working so much here. That's when I began to realize I'd be far more comfortable giving a talk from the heart rather than giving a lecture or demonstration on any topic. That's how I felt I could best honor the tradition of the Underwood Memorial Lecture. Rather than focusing on all the great aspects of teamwork, I really wanted to talk about all the great teams we have here at Florissant Valley. Everyone's Every one of them so connected to student support in so many ways. I think we've all heard the phrase, together everyone achieves more, related to teams and teamwork. And while I agree, I also think team spirit is a very powerful part of team dynamics. To further focus, I think our own internal spirit has much to do with our attitude towards helping others. I think one of the things that helps make our teams work so effectively is what I call the spirit within its members. For myself, the spirit within is what drives me to want to help someone. The feeling I get when I've helped someone is so strong and energizing, it usually makes any of the work or sacrifice worth it. For me, that spirit within makes me want to help our students in as many ways as I can. And that feeling is probably different for everyone here at Florissant Valley, but that spirit is always focused on helping each other help our students. That's what makes Florissant Valley such a great place to work. I'm not the only one who has this spirit within. It's all over this place. This is an institution filled with team members that individually have the spirit of education and student support at their cores. Everyone wants to help each other out. Everyone wants to be a part and has a part in the success of our students. Over the years, I've been able to be a part of many great teams that have accomplished many goals towards supporting our students and this institution. In nearly every one of the teams I've worked with, there's been this spirit within energy that was so evident. To illustrate, let me briefly talk about two outreach events that would never have been possible without, all, without teams that all had this spirit within. The most enjoyable and at the same time most physically demanding project I've ever worked on was the If I Had a Hammer team. This was a project that typically brought 16 to 20 students from, the math, from fifth grade on up to learn about how one could apply math to the construction trades and experience the teamwork that goes into building a house. The students were here for two hour sessions in which we actually put together a one room house complete with a covered front porch, a front door, a window on each side of the house, exterior siding, and a metal roof. Oh, and the front door actually worked. The students, so did the windows. Uh, we actually even used it in the rain. Anyway, anyway the students learn about safety, listening skills, how to use power tools and fasteners, how to use math to make sure the foundation was square, to figure out the spacing for the fasteners, to calculate the materials needed to find the center of anything. We had, had, we had all kinds of hands-on math learning in the program. All the while, we were actually pitching the idea there are more than 20 building trades that work together to build a house, and none of them really require a college degree. Kind of just like our STL works program that we kicked off last week downtown. It was tough work moving all the heavy lumber and parts of the house around. We built the house in sections that we made ourselves. I actually went out, ordered all the lumber, got some tools. We built everything from scratch. And that was after using a loaner kit for a year, and then they wanted $50,000 to borrow it for the next year. Anyway, they were kind of, everything was kind of prefab units. The walls were already prefabbed out and just studs. They were eight foot long by eight foot tall. 
The siding was plywood covered by cedar lap siding, so quite heavy. We had real trusses, we had real end gables with siding on them, metal roofing, functional roofs, our functional roof, it was two pieces, and even two porch posts. Every day we had to get all the units pre-staged before each build session. And then for two hours we directed the students to put it all together while making sure the students always had their safety glasses on. They weren't playing around with the power tools. I think we got a kid drilling another kid in the arm somewhere in here. Or the ladders, or the pieces of the house. It was really stressful sometimes. It typically took four to five faculty or staff to run the two-hour session. And Rich Unger and I, who ran most of the events, always had help from other faculty and staff. Some of the key players you may remember seeing in action were Christopher Matson, Bill Hoffman, Kevin Porter, Carl Fisher, Judy Larson, and Laurie McDaniels from the Construction Training Academy. Even Tom Bingham, Bill Mason, Ashok Agarwal, Terry Freeman, Dan Landis, and Scott Martin were frequent team members. This truly took a team effort, and although many who helped did not really enjoy it as much as Rich and I did, <laughs> they were always team players. They never complained about how hard the work was, or how difficult some of the students were, or how it was not in their job description, or the big one. They didn't even complain about not being paid extra for the extra work. Everyone who helped volunteered on their own. Nobody was voluntold, even when we were hurting for team members on Fridays. There was always this spirit that this is for the students, and even more exciting, it was for our possible students. We had just about every high, junior high school student in our service area and outside and beyond, Rockwood, Pattonville, they all came out to campus at least once during its existence. We easily had over 3,000 students on campus. This project went on for somewhere between six and eight semesters, and in the beginning three semesters, we were running events four to five days a week, twice a day. That meant the team had to give up two hours of their time in the morning, then we had to tear it down ourselves, which was sometimes tough because the kids loved to hide screws, and oh man. Then we had to restage all the materials and do it again for two hours with less than an hour break. Truly, no one ever complained that I heard of, and we all still got our regular jobs duties completed on time. I still get goosebumps thinking about that project. I lost 20 pounds and found aches in places that I never had before and I, the doctor will tell you, I still got them today. Some of you may remember being on a college building team during the two different staff development days that we invited everyone to participate in. As Cindy noted earlier, the build session we did for childcare, which was the last time we got to build the house as a team, is one of my fondest memories. Probably the best example of how great our various teams on campus work together is the first robotics competitions. This is some of the experience, is probably the largest event this campus hosts each year for the last 14 years. Our key partner for first is Susie Matthew. If she doesn't mind, from St. Louis Blues fame, I will tell her, or tell you. And our campus leader for first robotics activities on this campus is Tom McGovern. And without this support, this event would never be possible. The stuff Tom does behind the scenes, what Susie does, it's just, it's, it's a major project. This event requires the support of almost every team on campus. The maintenance department team sets up all the special wirings we need, all the rigging for the media services, and all the other things to do, hanging posters, putting rugs out, it's just amazing. The housekeeping team gets the facilities ready and works to keep it clean 12 hours each day, and I'm amazed the mess a thousand visitors can do to a building. I don't think we've ever, never experienced, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And then they get the campus ready that night, all for a whole nother day's work. Then Sunday night, they get it ready because it's off an opening week on Monday for classes. The grounds crew puts in, puts in all kinds of work, helping us move things around and setting out the dozens of road signs we need in the frozen ground. I don't know how many times we broke those. Campus police teams make sure all the buildings and room doors are opened up and unlocked and providing, while providing services all day long. HVAC team is always available to adjust our heating or cooling needs, which changes several times each day, depending upon the volume of the people inside and I think the excitement level. The IT staff always make sure our technology needs are meet, met. 
The media service teams make sure we have the best audio and video coverage possible. We've set the standard for the competitions in the state of Missouri. The administration team makes sure we have all the support we need and promotion materials that we put out for the visitors. The cafeteria teams make sure we have the food for over 100 volunteers who come to campus to help run the event. Plus, they make sure we have enough food to feed the 1,000 visitors that are here each day. The student clubs get together and sell food at the snack bar and the gym to make sure everyone has a snack to get on all day long. And the radio station and theater even sometimes gets involved. Almost every team on our department or department on campus gets involved. Whether it's loaning us their crowd control poles, I've come around borrowing stuff, or volunteering to help. Many, very, many others from various campuses volunteer their team time to serve as judges, referees, technical staff, and even field resetters. You may have heard a buzz here. Can I get everybody to stand up right now? My Fitbit says we, we should be moving around. <laughs> I don't know about you. Mine says to do twists, and I never do it, but you know, just whatever makes you feel like you haven't been sitting here forever. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So there's a good stretch there. That make me feel like I'm one, too. So when I'm not working on a team project related to student support or community outreach, I get to focus on the best part of all my jobs here. And that's doing what I can to support the students, faculty, and staff. No matter what hat I'm wearing, helping the students learn and find ways to solve their problems is the favorite part of my job. Whether in the classroom or lab as their instructor and classroom coach, or in the engineering technology center in the role of educational assistant, I really enjoy working with our students. To me, it's one of the best forms of hands-on learning we can give. Often we'll sit down at the computer or the drafting table, or we'll go into one of the labs and get the equipment out and see if we can actually solve the problem or the question that they're working on. I think hands-on learning is a very valuable tool, and we have the best labs in the state. I'm especially proud of what we've been able to do in the Engineering Technology Center over the years with our team of assistants, of our, with our team of technicians, educational assistants, and student assistants, or student technicians. I've always strived for the Engineering Technology Center to be a value-added resource for all of the college, not just this campus, not just our students. Over the years, we've been involved in a variety of in, in supporting a variety of services, such as drafting and design needs for every building on campus and even other campuses. We've done all the safety and training signage needs for the campus here. And we're always involved in outreach activities. For years, someone from the team was always out in the Mobile Technology Center, at least weekly. We provide support for other laboratory needs on campus and instructor support both in the classroom and in the laboratories. We've helped instructors design experiments, develop testing procedures, design, print, and assemble specialized fixtures, jigs, and parts. We've designed, etched, and manufactured complete printed circuit boards and built all types of stereo chassis, complete stereos, preamps, power amps, uh, different types of speakers, subwoofers, all saving the college lots of money for not actually having to purchase the equipment. As we all know, it's very expensive to have custom training equipment manufactured for education. You buy a speaker for your house, it's $10. You buy a speaker for your school, it's $100. So we made our own. We've had some great student workers with exceptional talents over the years. Without our team of student workers, we could never do what we do in the lab. Even our student workers catch this spirit within bug and typically rise above and beyond what expectations they even have of themselves. Another pride I have for this campus is that we have a great wealth of other student support and learning centers for our students to use. If during the semester a student needs to get help outside of the class, he or she can visit over a dozen different labs or learning centers on campus to get almost any kind of assistance they need. We've got the Academic Support Center, We've got the Mathematics and Science Learning Center, the Peer Tutoring and Academic Success Lab, the Speaking Lab, Supplemental Instruction and Group Tutoring Lab, the Writing Center, the Business Computer Center, Campus Life Office, oh yeah, the ETC, Liberal Arts, the, learning, the Library Learning Lab, the Reading and Study Skills Center. And that's just our latest list. And I have thanks to Mr. Pfeiffer for helping us with that. 
And if any students need any help with their personal computing needs, the About Club, a student club, the About Club is there ready to help them in the business building. Besides all of our great labs and learning centers, students have the support of the advising center team, all of the teams in the admission area, the assessment center, now known as the testing center, the bookstore, the career development team, the cashier's office counseling, child development learning center, campus police, the honors program team, the Emerson STEM Academy, the library trio, the radio station, and the theater. Again, you can find the spirit of support everywhere. We can't forget about all the other great teams we have to support all the other aspects of what goes into this great institution. None of us would be able to do anything without our college's campus leadership teams and all of our committees and project groups. In addition, we can't forget all of the departments and division offices teams. They are key resources for all of us. And none of us would be able to get paid without or buy anything without the business and services team. We couldn't get our books and supplies to our students without the bookstore team. The library team, without them, we wouldn't have access to so many valuable resources. Without our IT team, we couldn't use our computers, our phones, or the pole vault classrooms, which are really pretty neat now. Without the power plant team, we'd never get the room temperatures right, which we all know is a struggle due to the age of our HVAC system, not our team. Without shipping and receiving team, which is sometimes just one guy, Bob, we couldn't get any of our supplies or get anything moved around. And I think I've already noted what great teams we have in housekeeping, grounds, and the maintenance department. Finally, all of our students have the support from a great team of faculty members, both full-time and adjunct, who all have the spirit. Without the ability for our students to have these great instructors, we would not be able to continue to support the mission of the college to expand minds and change lives. And I know I've probably missed a team or two or three, and I apologize. But I hope you can see from my examples, our students have available to them every resource they need. And thanks to all of our great team members who all have that spirit within, they can get any type of help they need to be successful. My second favorite most part of the job is to share what used to be known as the best kept secret in North County, which is our campus. But now the word's out, and especially anything to do with our educational opportunities within our one college system. It is so uplifting to show off what fantastic facilities and labs we have here at this campus. I'm always looking for ways to get the word out. As I mentioned before, I get a great feeling inside that fuels that spirit within when I'm helping someone. I'm not looking for a thank you or anything in return. It's more like I'm trying to feed that spirit in me. It's something that just needs to be fed. When I see they understand or they get the help they need it, I know I've done a good job. But I do have to admit, when I get an unexpected special thank you, such as this recognition, um, it gives you a real boost to the spirit. Right around the time I found out about receiving the Underwood Award, I was working with some prospective students and their parents who were actually getting the runaround at other institutions in this area that I won't mention. One day while at the fitness center, a fellow coworker asked me if I would talk to a relative's family about a career path for their son. Talk about excited. Right away I said, sure, how about this Friday? And those of you who know me, I'm not often here on Fridays. Well, after meeting First with the son for about three hours, just three and a half hours with just the son only. I asked, I said, can I just meet with the son? We know how the, the helicopter parents can be sometimes. And uh, we had a great meeting. Then a second meeting with the parents was, was, was wonderful. We spent two hours together. And then a third meeting with the second son and the whole family again all day at our preview day last spring. I received this thread of thank you emails that I'd like to share with you in hopes that you too Get that special feeling inside. Here's the first email I received after meeting with the family's son. Note the names have been changed to respect the privacy. My name is Sue Smith, and my husband Sam and I wanted to echo the sentiments of my cousin Keith. A big thank you for the grand tour of your department that you gave our son Joe a few weeks back. Joe was very interested in everything he saw. He was quite impressed with your knowledge and the wonderful facilities that are available to students in your department. We were wondering if you would have any time for a brief meeting and a tour this Friday afternoon so that we could see firsthand some of what Joe told us about. We think one of your programs could be a good fit for Joe and would like to discuss with you how to best transition him to your campus in the future. We would also like to discuss possible job opportunities for Joe upon completion of your program. And here's the email I got after our second meeting. 
Thanks again for the time you spent with us last Friday. Now my husband and I have a better understanding of the wonderful programs and facilities you have to offer at Florissant Valley. We can certainly see why Joe was so taken with it. Yes, we would like to attend your open house event this Saturday. I will also be bringing my younger son Johnny along since he is currently a junior at Parkway Central High and is ready to start looking at colleges. You mentioned that we should meet with the department chair regarding Joe's situation. We are certainly interested in doing so. Please let me know what would be a good time for that. We do hope to see you again on Saturday and also hope to speak with an, an academic advisor to assist with planning Joe's next steps. Thanks again for the kindness you have extended to us and we hope to see you again soon. So then I made sure that we had some people that they could talk to at the uh, preview day and thanks to all the teamwork we did. Thanks once again for the kindness you have extended while showing my boys around Florissant Valley on Saturday. As busy as you were, you made time to allow Johnny to create his 3D car. You even spent time working with him personally despite all the other tasks that were pulling at you on such a busy preview day. You have made both of my boys feel like VIPs and we really appreciate it. We certainly enjoyed meeting Tom McGovern and had an informative chat with him about all of the exciting opportunities you offer at Florissant Valley. Joe has made an advising appointment on Wednesday, April 17th at three with Maurice Davis, as you suggested. I later find out that we've added another student to our team of students in the engineering technology department. Signed up for two of Tom's classes this semester. And most likely we'll be adding one more soon. Although I feel I've always had a team spirit attitude, I remember when I was younger, I did not do a good job of showing it. I credit my good buddy Ken Smith, a supervisor of mine in the early 80s and a previous Underwood recipient for changing my attitude from a, I don't know, maybe, I guess we could try, to sure, we could try anything to help frame a mind for the rest of my life. Thank you, Ken. I also credit Ashok Agarwal, also a previous Underwood recipient, for always challenging me to step up to the plate and putting way too much on my plate on a wide variety of projects that were not on my job description, but did fulfill my passion to help. As you may be aware, we no longer publish an internal phone book like we used to. We're told everything's on the web and we need to save trees. I think myself, we would benefit if we had a publishable directory of who's who on all of our teams. If anyone's interested in helping me figure out all of the team members on campus and their roles and find a way to make it easy to present, please send me an email or better yet, stop by my office. I've got lots more mountain pictures to show. And if you'd like, I can take you to our 3D printing lab, the Advanced Manufacturing Center, show the robot lab, or maybe even the stereo lab. So as I've mentioned before, the spirit we have here at Florissant Valley, and truthfully within the entire college, is so powerful and so student support focused that I feel we can almost accomplish anything as a team. Sorry, visitors. to. The Underwood is a Florissant Valley only tradition, so sometimes we tend to really brag about ourselves here at the event. I know we're one college and have excellent teams at all of our locations that also have the spirit. We're all in this together and support each other in so many ways, I again feel we can do anything. Well, maybe not yet cure cancer or find world peace, but I wouldn't put past any of our students in the future. Before I go, I'd like to Go over what's up with the memento you'll be receiving as you leave. One of the new traditions for the Underwood is for the presenter to select a memento to be distributed after the event. I found this neat little cell phone holder or tablet holder that I've used before to hold up my phone and it works out pretty nice. And at the same time, it reminded myself, it reminded me of myself with my smiling face and sometimes wild hair. Turns out, the mop, <laughs> turns out the mop head hair on this guy is for cleaning your screen and is next for winding up a charger or an earbud cord. Now that's technology. In closing, I'm truly grateful for this recognition of my years of doing a job I really enjoy. The feeling I get knowing I'm expanding minds and changing lives keeps me energized and enthusiastic about coming to work every day. And so are those mountain trips. 
whether it be student support or team support, it's the spirit within me and it's the spirit within all of us that bonds us together to allow us to fulfill our students, to fulfill their dreams. Thank you all for coming again. Now go out and have a great semester. Oh, and yeah, the point I was trying to make, get ready. You may have your first telepresent robot soon in class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Hopefully they'll be wearing an STLCC shirt. Thank you all very much.